to today's episode of Color Theory and today we will be looking at complementary colors. So purple, you are so good looking. Yellow, oh you're wonderful. So the complementaries complement each other. It's as simple as that. That's why they're called complementary colors. If you put a yellow next to a purple, they're going to make each other sing. So not only do complementaries make each other look good, they also are very good in calming each other down. And if you get out your color wheel that you made in the first week, we'll talk about that now. Today I'm going to explain complementary colors as I paint this landscape in acrylics using only two complementary colors and white. I may get some charcoal and put in some darks after I've finished doing the painting. I won't be using any black paint at all during this exercise. This exercise can also be done in oils if you prefer to work in oils. At the end of this lesson, I will be giving you an additional exercise mixing a complementary color chart. You don't have to do it, but then you don't have to do any of these exercises. If you really enjoy mixing colors and find it relaxing, then you can go ahead and do that exercise. Have a look at the color wheel that you created in week one. So your primary, primary red, primary yellow, primary blue. When you mix two of these primaries together, you get a secondary color. So red and yellow, you get orange. Yellow and blue, you get green. Blue and red, you get violet. So if you mix a primary red and a primary blue, you get a violet. And what is the other primary color that you're not using? It's a yellow. And the yellow is the complementary to the violet or the purple. So that you'll find the primary colors and the secondary colors are complementaries to one another. And they're located across from the color wheel from one another. So the red and the green are complementaries, the blue and the orange are complementaries, and the yellow and the violet are complementaries. The colors between the secondary colors and the primary colors are called tertiary colors. So that red orange, yellow orange, it's between the orange and the yellow, that's a tertiary color. I might be saying it wrong. <laughs> Between the yellow and the green is a yellow green, that's a tertiary color. Blue green, blue violet, red violet, those are all tertiaries. And they also have their own complementary. So a red violet, its complementary will be a yellow green. And a yellow orange, its complementary will be a blue violet. But you get the idea. So if you have a, a comp if you have your own color wheel, that's what's really great about it, is because you learn you know, what are the complementaries to every single hue that you have in your rainbow color chart here. And um, you can also see when you put a tint in it, it's the same thing. So this pink here, its complementary is that kind of minty green there. You can also use, uh, when you're doing complementaries, you can also say that this red, its complementary is also this tint here. So whatever you've decided that you're going to paint today, it could be a landscape, it could be a still life, it could be a face, doesn't really matter. Whatever you do, just keep the colors that you're using simple. Don't use the tertiary combinations today. Stick to the primary and its secondary. Either you're using a red and green, or using yellow violet, or orange and blue. It's now time for us to begin stage one of our painting, so let's get started. Have a look at my image. My orange is very bright, but as in terms of the value, it is actually quite light. So when I'm doing my value study to begin, it's going to help me. I'm using a canvas today. I've painted over an old painting. It's got a lot of texture. I'm using a titanium white, a phthalo blue, and mixing an orange with a cad red and a cad yellow. The first thing I'm going to do to create a value study is wet my canvas 
and add some paint. This is my primary blue or my phthalo blue. So get it all in there in the nooks and crannies and then I'm going to get either a wet rag or a, a wet sponge and in this case I'm using a wet sock and I'm going to wipe away all of the white areas that I can see. So I'm just working out my dimensions there. And so this is not really um, wiping away the white areas and drawing as such. It's a way to find the form. So that's why I'm wiping away the lighter areas that I see. And then I'm going to wet my sock and clean it a bit and then I can get even more paint off. You can see that it's much lighter now. Um, and I'm using my fingernail there just to get a little bit of that um, detail. Usually when I have my spray bottle that I can lightly mist my canvas with, it keeps the paint movable, it keeps it wet so I can uh, keep working on it and uh, I don't have that today so I have to work really fast. So if you don't have a spray bottle you're going to have to work very quickly because the acrylic, it dries very quickly. I like to use a very large brush, especially when I have a large area or when I'm beginning a painting. You get the information in much faster than if you're using a little fiddly brush. And I can, if I like to make expressive brush strokes, I can always go back later uh, with a smaller brush. I like to take a big step away from my work every once in a while and it gives me a chance to see things from a distance. You get the bigger picture and you can also see your mistakes. Um, it's just a way to refresh the way that you're looking at things. This technique of trying to find values, covering your canvas with some paint and wiping away all the light areas, um, is a very fast way of doing what we did in our last exercise which was all about values. So this is also finding your values, but we want to do it quickly so we can start um, beginning our, our painting quickly. Okay, my rocks are a little too tall and I need to shrink them down a little bit. Um, if you look at the tree, it's exactly the same value as the background, which makes it a bit tricky. So if I just add some different kind of brush strokes, then that, uh, that'll take up some space so I can figure out where those rocks are going and I can lower them. I think that my overall proportions are probably not exactly the same as my reference because I didn't bother to check that. Um, I check the proportions and try to make them all perfect when I'm doing a portrait or a figure. But landscapes, I think you can wing it. You can be far more organic and, and um, no one's going to question if your rocks in your painting are bigger than the rocks in your um, reference photo. It doesn't really matter. Now I'm using my fingernail to kind of scratch into the surface, which is called scraffito, um, just to find the, the edge of that uh, rock. So I am doing a little bit of mark making. Um, I'm also using the paint that is still wet on the canvas, picking it up with my finger, moving it around. I'm scratching some grass in there with my fingernail as well. Okay, I think that I'm nearly finished here. I don't have to go as exact as we did with our value study that we did the other day. This is going to be a good base for me to begin my stage two of my painting with the complementaries. And I have my first complementary blue down already. Mix your secondary color first. I am creating an orange. I am going to pre-mix my colors today. I don't normally do this. I'm doing it so I can explain how to get tone from your complementaries. Usually I would just use an orange. I would have that pile of orange. I would have my phthalo blue handy and I'd have my white and I would just wing it. Um, that's because I have a strong understanding of complementary colors. So there's my orange that I've mixed up and now I'm going to add some tints to it. So just a little bit of white. Just in the way that we created our values in our last exercise, uh, you're going to be doing the same thing with your oranges. We're not using any black though, so you're just doing tints. Um, so you're going to do it with your oranges and you're going to do it with your blues. And um, then we're going to mix the oranges 
and the blues together. Now, I just realized that you may not be using the same complementaries as me. You might be using red and green, or you might be using yellow and purple. But whatever you are using, you want to do it in the same way. You want to um, mix your secondary color first, which would be your purple or your green, um, if you're using the other primaries. So now you're going to mix those tints together. So I have my pure hue, the, the blue and the orange, and then I have all the tints and I'm going to mix those uh, tints together. Um, and now I'm creating tone. So you can see with the phthalo blue, um, I get some really clear greens with that orange. Um, so I was expecting mud, but I think that you're going to have to use maybe an ultramarine blue to get some muddy sort of orangey colors. Um, but they're really brilliant for the exercise, I'm, for the image that I'm using today. And they're also great if you're doing any ocean scenes. So I am just going to see how many different tones I can create just with um, the little tints that I made up uh, today. So I'm just spreading it all around and having a look. So like I said, this is just the pure hues um, mixed together, and that green is just beautiful. Now the orange, um, if I wanted to have more of a, a brown, if I wanted to create a brown using a complementaries, then I would need that orange to be just a little bit redder. But you can see even there, I've got quite a nice sort of toned down orange color. And that is going to come in handy for my rocks for sure. And you can see these oranges. I might maybe even use that kind of orange color when I'm um, when I'm painting faces. And you can see just having a little tiny bit of that blue in there really tones it down. Now once I have um, all of these colors mixed up, I want to have a look and see what they look like next to my image. And they actually look really good and I think that I can use those and I'm ready to start working on my canvas now. I'm all set up and I'm ready to begin. I will start by putting some phthalo blue in the dark areas of the rocks um, and then I need to create some tone for um, those rocks. They're round. Any time that there's a bit of depth, I need to create that depth. And you can see that I'm going to tone down my orange by putting in a bit of um, the phthalo blue into that. So I'm going to create a bunch of muddy colors first. And a lot of times the first things uh, painters will do is they'll put their bright colors in. I like to start with the mud and then work my way up to the brightness. The background, I won't have to tone down that phthalo blue. I will just add a tint down at the bottom so it'll be from dark uh, to light. So no, no tone required there. So I am going to first start by doing a little section in a little bit slower time for you to see what I'm doing. So all over the rocks, all under the grass, on the side of the trees, all of that needs some toned down orange color because it's pretty much orange. Now you can see if I mix um, the orange and that phthalo blue together I get a green. It's a muddy green but um, that's fine. It's going to work perfect for this exercise. And you can see now I'm adding some brighter oranges to my rock and the oranger I put that color on the left side of the rock um, you know, it's going to get brighter and it's going to start looking a little bit 3D, not so flat. When I'm working um, something like hair or if I'm doing grass, um, I don't do every single blade. I do sort of a little section of lights and darks uh, within that uh, grass. Oh, now I'm scraffitoing some uh, some trees there. Um, and back to what I was saying about the grass. Um, I'm, I don't do every single blade, but 
I paint in the direction that the wind is uh, blowing that grass. Um, so I've been, I'm using a flat brush, which is um, good to begin with because it gets some nice broad areas and it's good to get angles. It was good to work that um, grass as well. Now one of the things to, um, to think about when you are doing an object that is receding at the back, like a rock, the, the, the side of it will be receding, it's going backwards. So I don't want to have um, any sharp edges on something that is uh, rolling back in um, the space. Those areas, I want to keep them a little bit blurry. Um, the, the minute that you make a, something that's receding, um, and rolling backwards, you make it sharp, you've now flattened it out a little bit. So just keep those edges uh, blurry, it'll be better. Using my fingernail to scraffito. Some little blades in there to roughen it up because it was getting all the directions of the, my brush strokes were all just too same samey. So just a little bit of scratching in breaks them up a bit. Now, a lot of people are asking me why, why do I put my background in after my foreground? So I can be more organic and looser when I'm putting my limbs in, in my, my branches. So you can see I'm just putting them in, but I can fix them up and um, make them a little bit thinner or thicker by fixing up by putting the, the sky in between the negative spaces there. It just makes it a much looser picture, I think. And I can just put in the little negative spaces between those leaves as well with my phthalo blue and a bit of white. So there you go. There's my first um, section done. And I'm going to go into a time lapse. time for me to step back and have a look at my artwork. Um, coming closer, I can have a, a look and see where it needs some work. That rock there um, on the left, it's got too much dark compared to the one on the right. So I need to blend those together so you can't see where one begins and where one ends. Um, also, this uh, in the middle rock there, the one that looks like an egg, that little section there, one of the the values needs to be lighter in the foreground there. Um, so those rocks look like two different rocks right now. And that rock there, I changed because it looked uh, too much like a part of a female's anatomy. And so I just changed that rock. It, no one will know. This little section here, um, I broke up all those strands by using the palette knife and um, 
just kind of roughing some of the rocks up in that grass and I kind of like how that how that worked out I'm quite happy with that so I have some willow charcoal or some compressed charcoal I should say um, and I'm going to kind of work that into some of the areas that I want them just a little bit darker than I could get with that phthalo blue or with um, the tone that I was creating with uh, the complementaries together. Now that uh, piece might be just a little bit big so I'm going to have to get a smaller piece I think. So I got a little smaller piece there. Now this stuff is pretty hard so you got to kind of dig it in there a little bit. So the texture that I put down on my canvas um, is basically I glued down some tissue paper. Um, I had an oil painting that I wanted to paint over and um, the easiest way for me to do that in, in, and the cheapest instead of buying um, uh, the gesso for oil paints is I just glue down some tissue paper and then uh, gesso that with normal gesso and then it's ready for some oil or acrylic as I did in this case but I was covering an oil painting um, it's fun to do like this is a little bit like a mixed media because I've got the paper down first and then I'm um, adding my mark making afterwards so when I do landscapes I like to add a little bit of marking up to it keeps it looser um, I'm not really interested in doing a full-on uh, photorealistic uh, rendering but I think I actually got pretty close um, to the photograph without trying but but you can see how bright that orange is and how bright that blue is next to one another because of the fact that they're complementary colors they're just stunning um, and the tone really brings the whole thing together as well. So I hope you created something wonderful and you learned a lot. If you tried um, yellow and violet and didn't work, try another combination. Um, the orange and blue works really well. So thank you very much for joining me today. Um, and there's another little exercise if you want to do it. Um, otherwise, I'll see you next time. Thanks again. Bye. Look at the tones here and how different they are depending on what blue you use, a warm blue or a cool blue. Just add some black and you have a whole new set of tones to, to work with. Um, same with the red. If you use a warm red or a cool red, it's going to make a big difference to your greens and toning those down. And if you add a little bit of black, again, look at all those tones. With the yellow and the purple, warm and cool purple makes a big difference. And if you add black, you can see in some of the areas you get more of a green when you use yellow. So your challenge is to create some color charts using the different combinations of the um, complementary colors and um, creating some tints to them and then adding them together to make tone just in the way that um, I showed you here. So you'll be using the yellow and uh, purple, red and green, or orange and blue so um, I hope you enjoy that too and learn a lot okay thanks bye